No, nope. I'm good. There it is. I have a brand new mic today. So hopefully those issues we've been having won't happen again. Um, this is the last uh, sermon I'm going to preach in our Acts series. And I'm a little bit sad to leave this text. Uh, my sadness is probably driven by the fact that um, I was really surprised at how this story of God's people, the transformation of this small group of followers um, who became this global community, how their story has been able to speak to us so powerfully in the last nine months. I really should not be surprised. I, I know that, you know, I shouldn't be surprised that Scripture has the ability to do that. But sometimes um, it does catch me off guard. But the power of the Word to speak to our lives is probably uh, just a reflection of the fact that it is a living Word. And while it does not change, it is not a living, evolving Word. It is a living Word, meaning it is able to speak to each generation anew, to each person in their heartache and their struggle, that the relationship that God extends to his people, when they are willing to listen, to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say from any text, is powerful to bring about the blessings that we need. And so I, I feel I'm a little, I am sad to think that we're going to do something new. I know that doing something new is important because I already put the Christmas lights on my house. I, I really did. I'm the first in my neighborhood. We're new to our neighborhood as well, so some of my neighbors may have been like, that guy's really early. But I think it's important for us to be reminded of the blessing that we have been given with the coming of Jesus and to be reminded again of the promises that God wants to speak to us through those prophetic messages. So we pick up one more time with Paul, who's been making his way to Rome with that slight detour or major shipwreck. Depends on how you want to think of it. And I think we need to be reminded in that moment in this reality of Paul's eventual arrival into Rome, that he's been told this is going to happen. And so the detours along the way are simply inconveniences. But God is able, regardless of how bumpy the road is for us, to help us arrive at the destination that he wants for us, to reveal his glory and his power. And that isn't just... Um, eternal life somewhere off. So I think sometimes we can get that stuck in our head, that this is hard, and so ultimately we'll all arrive, and God will be blessing us with the revelation of Jesus, and we'll all stand in his presence. But one of the things that Jesus promised his followers was blessings in this life too. And that's a hard thing for us sometimes. We want to turn everything into arrival at our destination of eternal life. But there are things that you have ahead of you in this life that are still waiting for you to accomplish because of the will of God. And I think we have to fix that in our mind, especially in moments of hardship like this. And so Paul makes his way finally to Rome, and he is going to stand before the most powerful man alive. That's a remarkable thing to think about, that the opportunity for Paul to testify about who Jesus is and what he believes before Caesar is a remarkable thing. And so I want us to pick up the text in Acts 28, verse 16. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews when they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, 
I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two things that I want us to try to focus on in this text. The first is this a very powerful reference to the message that has been given to Isaiah. Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 6. This is part of the call and commission of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah has been transported to the throne room of God, and he cries out because as a sinful man, he believes he deserves death just simply because he's in the presence of God. And yet he does not receive death. Instead, he receives mercy. And that mercy that he experienced in the presence of God compelled him to volunteer to speak the word of God to his countrymen in the hopes that they would turn, that they would turn their hearts to God. But up front, God tells Isaiah that many will not hear, many will not see. And this is mirrored in the life of Saul. He saw Jesus on the road, and kneeling in the light of the truth, the glory of who Jesus is, the Messiah, Paul confesses that Jesus is Lord. Now, Paul receives the grace of God, forgiveness for his stubborn refusal to believe the message of the apostles, the truth of who Jesus is. And he receives forgiveness for the persecution and his participation in the destruction that he hoped to bring about to the people who followed Jesus. It's a remarkable thing, the similarity between those two. And Paul ultimately becomes a messenger to his own countrymen, but then to the Gentiles because his countrymen, his fellow Jews, continued to reject the truth of who Jesus is. And this prophetic message is troubling to me, uh, both seen in Isaiah and in Paul. And it's because Jesus uses this exact same passage to explain to his followers why he speaks in parables. And he says that it is because otherwise they would hear and they would see, and they would turn from their sins and be forgiven. Now, here's why that's hard for me. I thought that was the point. You see, I'm, I'm just really a simple person. I thought that the point was to hear the message of the truth, to see the reality of who Jesus is, to turn from sin, and to be saved. 
but Jesus in speaking to the disciples, God in speaking to Isaiah, and Paul in speaking to this group of Jews tells us that the purposes of God have to be fulfilled first. And that's hard. Why doesn't it just work out? I don't want this path, this one where people continue to cover their ears and refuse to hear or refuse to see. I want the blessed path, the easy one, where people hear the message and they immediately repent. They transform their lives and they worship God alone. If you take that, just as an aside, that feeling, that desire that we have, that that's the way it would work out, You now know how to read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. The hope that Paul has that his brothers and sisters, his fellow Jews, would believe. And yet his brokenness in the humbling reality that they won't. And it crushes him. The same way that it should crush us. That there are people who are around us that won't listen. But you're used to that, aren't you? That's the world you live in every day. People who won't listen. Oh, they're happy to talk, but they don't want to hear. They're happy to tell you, but they don't want to see. This message is also hard Because you see, I want to say this is all about them. But it's not. I have trouble. I have trouble. Allowing the grace of Jesus to defeat sin in my life. I know that may sound strange, but but it's really true. That in any moment of sin struggle in my life, the truth is I can cry out to Jesus and be freed from it. And yet so often I stubbornly refuse to submit simply to being a recipient of grace. And so the cycle of my life continues again where I feel stupid. I can't believe I did that. Why did I say that? Why did I think that? It's the refusal of my heart to really see that Jesus is on the throne and that my calling is to submit. And it's really hard to submit in the midst of hardship. I mean, if he really cared. Wouldn't he just fix? And I think that's why people have such a hard time. And yet the truth of God's message is that we have to be willing to hear and to see the grace of Jesus that has been extended to us. It's not some sort of deal you make. It is something you receive. And yet we like being in charge of our own life and having control. You see, it would seem that it's not just Paul or Isaiah or these Jews that were listening to the message of Paul that we all, it would seem, continue to struggle with hearing and seeing and experiencing the fundamental truth of the reality of who Jesus is. And perhaps if we are willing to confess, just like Isaiah did, just like Saul did when he was blinded, that Jesus is Lord, that I am a sinful man with unclean lips, with blinded vision. Perhaps 
that's when the will of God, the power to transform, really is seen to take an imperfect vessel. Because you see, we're depending in that moment not upon our strength, our knowledge, our understanding. We're depending instead upon the power of the Holy Spirit to move, to change, to empower, to take imperfect and fill it with his presence. That's what we depend on when we're willing to confess. You see, it's that same Holy Spirit that we have to invite in again. The one that blew in like a mighty wind, that pushed them out into the street, that sustained them through persecution, that moved them to new cities, to new communities, that brought Paul to stand before magistrates and governors and kings and Caesar. Because you see, only by inviting that Holy Spirit again can we really endure the hardships of our time. But not just survive them. Overcome them. Because I think it's in that overcoming, that persistent joy in the midst of hardship, that the glory of God can be revealed. And we're all invited to be a messenger of the power of God to transform our lives, to sustain us, to bring us joy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. That we can be a recipient, again, of the grace of Jesus. So that we can love and encourage those we encounter. There's one more thing I want to mention. And it's really going to set the stage for the next several weeks. Paul borrowed something else from the prophets in this text. This time he borrows it from Jeremiah and a man named Simeon. Paul proclaims that his chains, the ones he wears, are the result of his belief in the hope of Israel. Jeremiah calls out to God, and he, he speaks to him, calling him the name he gives him is the hope of Israel. O oh, hope of Israel, come. And Simeon looks upon the newborn baby Jesus and proclaims that his eyes have seen the consolation, the hope of Israel. In all things, we have to be a people who point to the presence and the reality of Jesus. God in the flesh. The one offered for our sin. Our redemption. Our atonement. We have to be the ones who call out in his name. That we pray through his name in order to be transformed into the people that God deserves to have worship him. And we're going to do that in a minute. We're going to sing some songs to God. But the reality is, you are just a vessel. An imperfect, flawed human being. And you don't deserve to stand in the presence of God. Let alone speak his name. And yet you were invited to let the Holy Spirit move through you, transform you, tune your heart so that you can praise God the way he deserves. And we're invited to proclaim that we believe that happens. That when we sing, when we speak, when we pray in Jesus' name, we are inviting the glory of God, the hope of Israel. Our hope to be present with us. That we can be before the throne. Not of a powerful man. Of an all-powerful, loving God. Let's sing to him.